I'm really disappointed because I thought Heather was going to do Renegade for me, which is my current favorite, my current favorite. Hi, I'm Lenita Dorflinger, I'm from FHI 360, where I'm the Director of Contraceptive Technology Innovation, and uh, let's get my first slide up here. And I'm here to talk to you today about contraception. I was going to have the audience scream contraception. Can you scream contraception? Okay, good, because here in North Carolina on most days, contraception is a bad word, so I wanted to be really convinced that everybody in this audience thought it was important to think about transforming contraception, and that's what I'm here to talk with you about today. And I wanted to say that in the last two and a half days, I've met some extraordinary people in this audience, people doing things that I'd never even heard about before, and I'm hoping that my talk will be a switch point, that some of the people in the audience that really are doing something completely different than this, will have great ideas as a result of some of the things that I'm going to tell you about today. So, a bit of history, since most of you don't eat and sleep and dream contraception the way that I and many of my team that are in the audience today do, I wanted to just remind you that um, the first, roughly the first uh, mention of contraception was in, in ancient Egypt in the time of Queen Nefertiti, and, and it was about condoms, and condoms were made from animal intestines, um, and I have to tell you that I don't have my little pointer here, but this, um, I was really disappointed because I thought that Queen Nefertiti was dealing with condoms and putting them on models, and one of my teens said, no, no, this is a board game, Lenita, don't be so silly. <laughs> okay, so fast forward about 3,000 years to the 17 and 1800s, and some of the first reference to the famous Casanova who would put halves of lemons into the vaginas of women with whom he was consorting and uh, cavorting. And then the actual cervical cap was created in 1838, about 45, uh, many, well, many years later. And then the diaphragm was invented the same year the Brooklyn Bridge, the famous Brooklyn Bridge was open. So I thought that was a very interesting convergence of history. The first IUD was actually inserted the same year the, the first expedition made it to the North Pole in 1909. And then about 70 years later, there were two important things that happened. A better IUD came along, the copper T380A, we call the Paragard here on the right, and Apple was founded just about the same time. And for those of you who have iPhones like I do, I want you to just kind of look at this and say, wow, does that look like this? No, but wow, guess what? Anybody that has one of those, it looks just like that. So all these years later, innovation in technology has moved mar markedly quickly, but in some areas of contraception, no. You heard from Roy about oral contraceptives. A few of you in this room are old enough to know Annette Funicello. She was one of my role models. She was a musketeer, and she was really a cool, clean, apple pie American girl. And I was in shock to learn that she was actually the poster child for Bayer Healthcare and for oral contraceptives which were uh, first approved by the FDA in 1959, 1957 rather, for severe menstrual disorders. And guess what? The incidence of severe menstrual disorders was pretty high in the country at the time. It dropped a little bit when the FDA actually approved OCs for contraception. And it was about this time, also not on the slide though, that injectable contraceptives were first introduced in Depo Provera. So what's happened since then? There have been a lot over the last 20 or 30 years, a lot of moves forward in technology. So for example, taking the same hormones and putting them in longer acting systems, longer acting systems that make them more effective because they're not so user dependent. So things like implants that are inserted in the inner aspect of the upper arm, they last for five years, maybe longer. IUDs that have hormones in them that are inserted and actually have a great thing that they do, they stop bleeding. And so for many of us, not bleeding is a real advantage. Vaginal rings, another way of, of, of again, delivering the same products. And then came HIV AIDS and the recognition that one needed dual, potentially dual protection against pregnancy and STIs. And you see here a couple of methods that were developed with uh, support from USAID. Tremendous support, the Silk's diaphragm, an improved one size, fit, size fits most diaphragm that could be used in conjunction with some type of a gel that could prevent certain diseases, not just HIV, but herpes or papillomavirus. And then a better female condom, actually the first female, a female condom uh, to, to add advantage. 
Then there were better ways of, use, of, of injectables. This little product here, uh, again, with great support from USAID, took almost 40 years to develop for a variety of things which had to do with uh, things like this, the, the pharmaceutical company that started was acquired three or four times. Um, but the Uniject device, a quick way to actually take injectables and task shift, make it easier for healthcare workers in the villages to deliver a system and for women themselves to self-inject and that's one of the things that, that uh, the field is doing now, studying self-injection. And then IUDs, they have evolved a little bit over time, although they're not broadly available. This is one of the latest ones called the intrauterine ball, thought to be smaller and maybe more comfortable. So how is that transformation, or what do we think about that? Well, there's some good news. You heard there's a broad armamentarium of methods. That's a big word that we like to use that means just a lot of options. But still, in 2013, almost 700 million women, married women worldwide, were, were, using oral contra were using contraception, and if you add to that sexually active unmarried women, the number goes up. But the bad news is that tens of millions of women are unhappy with their current options, or, and couples as well. And they discontinue in droves. And what happens is they go on to get pregnant. So many are not using, many discontinue because they're happy. And that leads, in 2012, to over 80 million unplanned pregnancies. And that was almost 300,000 maternal deaths that resulted. And in addition, there are many, many women who have an unmet need and are not using contraception. The number is a little higher than this now, estimated to be about 225 million. And about over about two, three quarters of those are related to method, method, method related reasons. And those are areas where we think there's a role for new methods. And so that's what I'm gonna do, is to tell you that there's a, a, an urgent need to expand choice. You heard from Roy that uh, this is, is, a, is a, an issue of equity and of social justice. And so what I want to do is, is to get you thinking about what are some of the potential new options. And, um, and new options take a long time. When you think about it, think about the people you're seeing on these slides, the young, the young uh, boys and the young girls. Those are the ones that may be ultimately the target users of what we develop. And we heard about user-centered design, trying to respond to the needs of people in the field, not just coming down from the top and saying, oh, that sounds like a great idea, or that sounds like a great idea. Some of the things you'll hear about today that I'm gonna just go through a quick list of are things that were driven by talking to users, talking to providers, thinking about what those better alternatives might be. So what attributes are important? We kind of live this model and think about an ideal method. There's really not an ideal method because we all are different. We all have different needs. We have different needs when we're young than when we're perimenopausal. We have different needs throughout our reproductive lives as we're having children and spacing children. But we always want methods that are highly effective and safe. Many women want discrete methods, things that they don't have to tell their partner about. Low provider involvement, that's the new buzzword, task shifting, moving things out to lower level healthcare providers to, and to the users themselves. Additional health benefits, what about a, about a contraceptive that has a side effect that it reduces one's risk of cancer? That sounds pretty cool, we already have one. Oral contraceptives reduce the risk of ovarian and endometrial cancer, and most people don't even know that. But we think and we dream about new options that could do that. But I think the single most important thing for us in this room is cost. And it's amazing what a difference even 20 cents makes in a method. And uh, so as we are looking at, at FHI 360, at some of the new innovations that we're working on, cost and cost and cost are the three most important things to us. Well, innovation is cool too. So let's just talk about what could be transform, uh, transformative, transformational, game-changing types of methods. And I'm just gonna run through these. I'm not gonna show you a lot of pictures, but I'm gonna tell you words and a little bit about what they are and why they're important. And then if you have any great ideas, please come to talk with me. On-demand methods for infrequent sex. It's remarkable the number of people in the world and that are in these surveys that don't have regular sex, but yet they need a highly effective method when they do have uh, infrequent sex. Right now we've got on-demand methods like condoms and diaphragms, emergency contraception for postcoital use, but there isn't really anything that's highly effective and innovative and in coming along in that area. Reversible male options. For 40 years at least, people have, have invested 
in looking for options for men. There's been a lot of research on using steroids, contraceptive steroids in men. Looking at non-hormonal options, well, you know, there's not been a great, excuse me, a great amount of success in that area yet, even though there's research that's continuing. But looking at reversible, other reversible male options, that is something that could be transformative. There's work ongoing in the non-hormonal area, um, and there is, as I said, ongoing work in the hormonal area. But we really need something that would transform contraception by adding male options. An implant that's biodegradable. Implants that I showed you are widely avail broad, more broadly available now than they were even five years ago. But when it goes in, it has to come out. That's a burden for women. It's a burden for healthcare systems. And something at FHI 360, we're working on four or five collaborations that are uh, looking at uh, implants that would biodegrade at the end of their life. And so you wouldn't have to deal with the removal challenge. Multi-purpose technologies, we talked a little bit about, I did a little bit earlier, about the importance of recognizing that there are many uh, individuals who have a need not only for contraception, but a dual need for preve prevention of, of uh, sexually transmitted infections. User control methods that are highly effective, and maybe you could just have once and then turn on and turn off. And this is a really cool idea, something that the Gates Foundation is investing in. There's a group in, in Boston called Microchips that's working on a method that would be inserted and that it is, is activated externally to release drug every month. It, la it could last as long as 16 years. Wouldn't it be cool to transform that method not only to a longer acting approach, but something that might be on demand, something that would be a short acting uh, drug that could be released. Non-surgical permanent contraception. This is a new terminology for non-surgical sterilization, both for men and for women. Sterilization, not permanent contraception, is in great demand, but it's, it's well, it's, it's a surgical procedure, and there's often very long waiting times. It's not highly, terribly expensive, but the, the access is limited. Having something that would be a simple way of administering a, a, a product that could be permanent um, but non-surgical could be a true game changer. And then unique delivery systems. There are a lot of different things being worked on. We at FHI 360 are working on longer acting injectables because we've been told by women in the field that we love injectable contraception, but we wish we didn't have to come back so, so often. Or it's the rainy season and we can't actually get back to a health post. So both um, different systems as well as things that could be user controlled uh, user inserted would be terrific. And finally, my dream, immunocontraception. Something that, when I first started in the field of contraceptive development, was a hot item. A lot of money was invested in it. And what we learned was we didn't know enough about the immune system in those days to, to find an antigen that would be highly effective and that would last for a long time. But right now, we're actually using immunology to cure cancer. We're using immunology and we've, in many ways that we couldn't have even dreamed about 10 years ago. And I feel like in, in our lifetime, having a simple, affordable, forgettable way of using immuno, contra, uh, 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 immunology to provide contraception could be a true a true game changer and something that we'll do. And ideally, it would be great if you, this could be reversible. So for those who wanted a permanent method, there it is. If you wanted it reversed, there would be a way of doing that. So there are a lot of challenges. My time is running short, and I just want to deal with a, a, a couple of those. The physiology is complex. So if you're interested in that, you can come talk to me later. I, I just want to be able to say that to make a truly transformative contraception, contraceptive, we have to learn a lot more about the ovaries and the testis, which is hard to believe after all of these years. Developing drugs is a long and expensive process. The part of discovery right now is, is, uh, is very challenging for us. The timeline is long, particularly if you want a long-acting method. The cost is a stag, the estimates are staggering, like a billion dollars. It's obscene to think that it takes a billion dollars to develop a new product. And why is it obscene? Because in 2013, globally, only $63 million was invested in the entirety of contraceptive R&D for low resource settings, while Americans happily went on to spend five times that much on Halloween costumes for their pets. I think we need to reorder our priorities. So, 
even with that uh, Debbie Downer, I have reason for optimism because I carry one of these little iPhones around and it's unfortunately, I'm too tied to it. But in the early 1900s, here where we were, when I was growing up, here's where we were. Actually, in my hometown of Pennsylvania, we were more like here when I was growing up. But today, I carry on this, the amount of information that when I was in college, took a computer that fill, would fill this entire room. So if we can do that in, in 40 years or less, I'm confident that if we put our minds and our money behind the innovation, we can have a truly transformational contraception. Hello? Fallopian tubes closed tonight? Absolutely. Have a great time. <laughs> Thank you.